is solving someone else's problem and they've never seen your source code. They've never uh, used your library, but because you have published it, that brilliant way that you invented of doing something, the, uh, anyone saw that source code just in three lines of code that you made that did something really efficiently can find someone else. Welcome to CTIO 101 episode four open source strategy sponsored by Fairmont recruitment, hiring technology professionals across the UK and Europe. One of the topics that uh, it, it does the rounds, but, but anyone in business technology really needs to get their head around what's your approach with open source? What is open source? We've got a few areas we're going to go through. We're going to try and look at some of the cliches around open source and, and also explore your own experience and, and what you guys do specifically with open source, given that we're 101 to start mm -hmm. off with, why don't we try the definition? What would your 101 explanation be? What's work using instructions? They, they haven't got a, a mind or imagination of their own. You have to explain to them in great detail exactly what, to, right, what to make a cup of tea. Uh, and you discover that it always tastes awful. The instructions that have told that robot how to make that cup of tea are from you. So that's closed source. You have no idea why the cup of tea tastes so bad. Of course, everyone in the world can see the instructions that be given to the robot to make the cup of tea. Uh, do you reveal that and as soon as you open the source? Uh, you can see that the robot has been told to put the tea bag in the milk, stir it for five minutes, and then add some boiling water. Boiling water. We know that's a terrible way to make a cup of tea. You need to put the boiling water. Obviously, robots can only read zeros and ones. So that source code, whether it's open or closed, is converted into something called binaries before they're given to the computer or the robot. Just making the source code open doesn't make a better cup of tea. It does not make it better. But what it does mean that people who can eat about how their tea tastes can complain about it vociferously on the internet and say, this is awful. The instructions are all wrong. And this is how you should be making a cup of tea and the steps to that one is, is, is all very well understanding how to improve code. And you know, that means reading it and the more eyes you've got on it, the better. And so open source gives you some advantages there. Now, making those improved instructions available. And then finally, for people actually giving their robot the new instructions. Open versus closed source question is really how easy is it to see how a computer or a robot has been instructed to behave? So I've never heard it explained like that before, which I think is absolutely brilliant. So I want to play back to you what you've just said, see if I've got it right and use it an analogy I've just made up on the fly, which is always risky. <laughs> So would a similar analogy be, you go into a restaurant, you, you order an omelet and you eat the omelet you go, God, this is absolutely amazing. I love it. But you want to improve or you want to improve on that omelet and you go and ask the chef and the chef says, I'm sorry, I'm not telling you how I made it. It's a secret. And that's your kind that's of it. closed source. That's it. Open source is he welcomes you or she welcomes you with open arms and says, actually, I'm part of a community of chefs. And we've been spending the last 20 years on how to create the perfect omelet. Can see you're passionate about omelets. Come and join yeah. us. Been through the pain of learning how to make the, uh, omelet to keep that secret for yourself so that people have to buy their omelets from you saying every world should benefit from this amazing recipe. And by doing so people together who are like-minded, which in itself is a, a you know, social thing, which we're all to all of us. So you've transformed your mission from making the most money you can from your secret recipe, which one day someone will find out or improve upon. You've converted your mission to making the perfect omelet. And it is very much that distinction between why are we doing this? Are we doing this in order to make the world better? Or are we doing this in order to make ourselves richer? And you have to do both, right? There is a balance to be struck, but I find that when you open source to the community, they come back to you for work for other reasons, right? They're like, oh, look, I know you're the guy behind the omelets, but we've, we've got a new mission and we want to make the perfect. So come and work with us. And so like then be a closed source project. So that's very much how we operate at Panorama Data is here is the stuff which we want everyone to use for free because we want to help the community. And we find that as a result of that, people come to us source work. We won't keep going back on about omelets, et cetera, but that restaurant <laughs> where you've had that great omelet, not only yeah. was it great, the chef was very open with you about how they've made it. And actually already you've got trust there and you're thinking, you know what, I think I'm just going to come back and eat here because 
they're really cool. There's trust and we can probably do some other really cool things especially in a world where the first position seems to be, we're not telling you anything, this is a black box, which is really maybe becoming very outdated as a way of selling. So I think the whole world is moving away from transactional sales and towards relationship establishment. If you look at the way the whole industry is going towards software as a service, right? If you're selling software as a service, you're not doing one of the license sale, like, you know, a copy of office or machine and, and that's it. And if you want to by the next version, you have to, you have to be a capital cost for the, for the next version of the software. The whole world is moving towards a, a model where you, in effect, and this is what most companies are moving to with Office 365 and the offering around that space. And not, not so much a rental model, but a subscription service. So we subscribe to be able to use Word, which to many people seems utterly the wrong way to go about things. And yet that is a, a, a long-term relationship between the company Microsoft or whoever the supplier is, and that trust and the relationship is far more important to Microsoft. And we can see their revenues are doing fantastic things these days, than the closed source will sell you a transactional transaction with you and sell you this one copy of the software. So I think this whole move away from transactional sales in software and towards trust relationships, long-term and annual recurring revenue. I think is a model that will stick with us forever. Okay. It's, it's moving to other areas of society as well. So if you look at, uh, they don't have you on that one day, they're trying to get you on the annual pass, right? They want you to have ongoing returns to whatever the theme park is with your kids twice in the summer for their kid, your kids' lives. That's what they want you to move towards. Yes. And I think that in order to do that, they have to provide a much better experience. They have to also continue to innovate to make you want to keep coming back. That's another important thing is. By moving away from a transactional sale and towards a, a more as a service, you're encouraging the continued development and improvement of the software. Yes. I think that the same thing is true in the community as well. Uh, source open, you're encouraging continual improvements and the community input into those improvements. And I think we're certainly seeing that with Microsoft being very successful with their open source, all their .NET framework. If you just cast your mind back even a few years, if someone said to you, oh, Microsoft are going to go open source, you'd like, no, they're not. They are the very last people at the party, but with them, the sort of the new leadership, I think it's made them a much stronger, they're already a huge force, but it's probably got their roots and uh, you're getting loyalty from folks yeah. and embedding into the community. One of the things that gets banded about a lot, and I think some of our listeners will hear this, if they've never used open source before, this will be someone in the meeting might say, oh, actually I've heard that open source has inherent security flaws or weaknesses because we don't know who's working on it. So David, is open source software more prone to security flaws? then closed source, is it a myth? Is there any truths around it? What's your view on that? Source code, all software, inherent weakness that it was written by humans. Ooh, take a bit of software, the chances that have got zero bugs are tiny. There's no, most software that you use every day on your phone, on your laptop, will have bugs riddled throughout it. Most of them not very severe, but all of them potentially are a problem for you. And if, if you were any doubt on, on whether that was true, get software updates. Right? A lot of the reason that those software updates are co coming in is not just new features. It'll be whole swathes. If you look at the release notes, whole swathes of, of bug fixes, whether it's open source or closed source. Okay. Humans are mostly harmless. The code that they write is well-intentioned, but just flawed. Open source has inherent weaknesses. Closed source has inherent security weaknesses just by the fact that it was written by imperfect people used to be that we keep our weaknesses hidden, right? So but when you do that, the weaknesses remain. You've still got those weaknesses in your code and the computers are still running that flawed software. And so when you first make your source code open, everyone can inspect it, find the issues and exploit them. So it, when you first take a closed source project and you make it open source, you could be very careful because what you're then doing is revealing to the world, all your weaknesses and security holes. However, if your project starts off open source, you'll tend to fix those things as people spot them fairly quickly, uh, particularly anything related to security. There's a whole sort of, it comes with any security flaw that any developer will immediately try and close that and down because the last thing they want is people about their code, whether it's open or closed. That when you go from closed source to open source, you really have to go to one of the 
uh, that will do a full audit of your code base and make sure that it has no flaws at all from as far as I can tell. doesn't mean again, it's going to be perfect, but it means that you do have an independent eye on your source code yeah. before going from pure closed source to pure open source. Otherwise the community is going to rip it apart and also no one's going to trust it because you didn't have that previous trust relationship. So yeah, yeah. And be a, a sort of a, a switch on the inspected people, the, people will find fools and exploit them immediately. I've never thought of it as a, you start closed, then you go open and that being a vulnerable time because yeah. you've had previously maybe eight eyes, or sorry, eight pairs of eyes looking at it and now you've got thousands. So you've got that. Yeah. And I suppose when you start something, which is kind of greenfield open source, you're building on certain frameworks that have already got a lot of scrutiny within it. So you're starting from a different sort of point of view. So if folks are looking at open source, either looking to open source their own code. So if they're looking to make that leap to open source, or if they're looking at evaluating open source, understanding where that product is, its lineage, uh, and where, and how new or is important. And I suppose also the domain authority of whoever's checked their code as well, to make sure it's a bit like when you do pen test, you make sure it's done by a, a really reputable company. Otherwise it's not worth anything. Is that fair to say? I look at it in the way that you look at people who drive and operate computers, don't need a license, but you do need a license to drive a car, right? So there's a level that you have to get through. Otherwise your code is not even can, can compile, but above that level. Above the level where you can write hello world and put it out into the world. Yes. Everything else that you write on top, top of that can be awful and no one's ever looked at it. Yes. So I'd be super, very protective over my code and this is mine and, and, and this might be. You discover that the more eyes on your software, whether they are professional eyes or amateur eyes, the better. But when we write closed source code for our customers and they bring in an auditor. We used to be very nervous of that process. And now we're actively interested in where we've made mistakes. And I think that attitude is really important for any developer is a bit of humility and a bit of understanding that the code that you write is continually awful and get other people to inspect it. Whether that's your pair developer that you work with every day, line of code, if that was inspected at the time it was written, it would be of yeah. higher quality. You've got inspection running against your code and we use a fantastic bit of software got now static code inspection built in. So it will assess the quality of your code as you write it and um, flaws second that you've written the code and it will, there are independent, you can put into your code to inspect it at compile time. So for example, we use something called security code scan, which is a free thing. Anyone that uses visual studio should have it in all their projects. And it's just there inspecting you for security bad practices. It might not be intentional. You might have accidentally left a password somewhere, but it yeah. will tell you about it. Those tools are, are hugely valuable. And when you've got these third party auditors coming in to look at your code, they will, again, they'll run static code inspection, but they might look a bit more carefully and do some penetration testing and do all kinds of things that you yeah. wouldn't do yourself uh, while you're developing it. So I, I think the message here is it doesn't matter whether it's open or closed, the more eyes and the more processes that inspect your code for flaws as early in the process as possible, as includes as you're writing it, the better. So David, a quick question for you. I was at an event last night, which was all around it's mental health week. This, this episode will not be going out during mental health week. The topic they were covering was something called imposter syndrome, which is not a formally recognized condition, but it is something that's been talked about and quite prevalent in the technology. And it goes along the lines of, I'm not really good enough for what I'm doing. Someone's going to tap me on the shoulder. I'm going to get found out that sort of thing. And it just, when you were talking about making your code public, something you've written that, you know, uh, do you have to dig deep with your confidence to put something you, that you've written out there? It, have you ever experienced that or seen that? I'm just wondering whether that's something that our folks might think about in terms of actually making that leap to publishing their own code. I mean, look, yeah, this is something uh, I've written and they say, well, that's not very good. Okay. I won't ever publish again. I'm, I'm going to go and change jobs and become a, you know, librarian. I think the thing that everyone should in, uh, embrace is perfectly normal paranoia. Everywhere in the universe has that. We all have that, but the question is not really, are you good enough so much as what are your intentions? And if your intentions are to put out the best quality 
bit of software that you can, then it will happen. But it will be the best bit of software that you can produce. If you then open yourself up to the community to say, here is my flawed bit of software, it's a part, and that is a good thing. And, and so it becomes less about stuff and more about what is it that I am trying to achieve? And if what you're trying to achieve is high quality, then it, if what you are trying to achieve is whatever you can just throw there out there as quickly as it possibly can be thrown onto the internet, it'll be very low quality. So I was getting into software and thinking, do you know what? I'm, it's terrible and it's awful. The last thing I'm going to do put it, is put it on GitHub. I should flip that around completely and say, hello world on the internet. And I'm going to ask for criticism until it actually is writing war and peace. But that's, if that's your intention, start off by publishing the awful little bit of scrappy code that you've written. Because no one, someone is interested in what you're doing. And if it's sufficiently niche, believe me, there'll be someone out there in the seven, eight billion people in the world that'll be interested in it. Um, they will contribute, they will help, and they will become part of the community. And it's not about you creating it. It's about you facilitating the community and creating the best possible version of what it is you're trying to achieve. So what motivates a software developer? to actually contribute towards open source. When you contribute towards an open source uh, project as a developer, it, it's, you don't get paid, I believe, not directly. You obviously get some kind of benefit. So what's the motivation? Why, why do folks get stuck in to it from a developer point of view? Question. Mostly, I believe that people publish open source initially because they've just been through hell solving a particular problem. And they just want to prevent anyone else from going through that hell themselves. So by publishing it, really, they're just like on it and saying, this is now finished. It's almost like a, and now I can release my child out into the world and it can go out there and, and do good. It's always the motivation. The motivation is someone's got, I can't get my code to work. Here's the GitHub. Can someone on, um, Stack Overflow, please fix my code for me? Cause I'm, I can't get any further. Please. Cannot figure it out. I just do not know why this is not working. Yeah. Yeah. All been there. And quite often the answer is, oh, you just want to use this library over there. Someone's done it for you already. Again, there is almost everything written already. Again, uh, uh, massive generalization there, but there is a lot out there, isn't there? That people don't realize that a lot of people sit down to write things and it's probably been written maybe even a hundred times before. It's me onto a topic that I'm, I'm so excited about, which is the release of GitHub Poo Pilot, which is an amazing, um, uh, and it's basically. You write the comment about the code you're about to write, and it will then write the code for you. And the reason it can do that is that this AI has scoured the whole of GitHub, it has exactly 20 different implementations of the thing that you're about to write, and it knows which the best one is, and it will write it for you. Now, you have to be a bit careful. You have to read that it exactly intended. And if you phrase your comment wrongly before you, it types for you, do exactly what you described, not what you want, is a way of all of this open source that's being contributed out there isn't just going out into the void. You might be solving someone else's problem and they've never seen your source code. They've never uh, used your library, but because you have published it, that brilliant way that you invented of doing something can now be uh, anyone's so source code, just in just genius three lines of code that you made that did something really efficiently can be used by someone else. So here that the source code that you're writing there yeah. is out into the void and not being used by anyone. You might find that some bit of AI has picked it up, folded it in, and someone else now benefits from that. Does it accredit you? Does, so does your kind of standing increase right. because your bit of code has been used? It's down to what your motivation is, right? It, yeah. If your motivation is to get your problem solved, then you ask a question on Stack Overflow. If your motivation is to prevent someone else from having to write that bit of code ever again because it was a nightmare to, to, to figure out, then that's your motivation. If your motivation is to get someone to, to use your software and, and then maybe buy your support services, that's another motivation. There are multiple motivations of why people would open source. Got it. The answer is that you've got your legacy software, you're about to retire and you just want to make sure that it's, it's on the world, it's stored forever. That's another motivation why people do the things that they do. And there are David, these are very human motivations. They're yeah. also very grounded in engineering. I think a lot of people get into engineering because they want to make something that is really good, advances how people experience the world, but also yeah. has some kind of permanence. It's yeah, I built that. Please, when you're long gone, not going to star in a, a multi-million dollar blockbuster and that 
legacy won't be there forever. You look at some Vivid. amazing films that are coming out right now. Yeah, we all want to have been Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. It'll never happen. So our legacy is going to be a few lines of code. Don't, David, don't write it off. Don't write it off. <laughs> you never know. You might get that phone this call. This is my audition, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the next Iron Man. Don't, don't think I'll fit in the suit, unfortunately. Cool. When you're using, consuming open source, it, you may see the element that you're directly consuming, but that might be built on a number of other modules or, or parts of, of what are called dependencies. And if that runs quite deep, you, you might have quite a lot of homework to do before you really understand how solid the open source platform is that you're using. I, I wrote down the phrase, buyer beware. What's your approach when you're thinking about dependencies? I recently saw this, of course, with the log4j exploit, uh, which is a library used in thousands of different software packages. So these are all potentially vulnerable for many years with all software engineering, whether it's open or closed source, is to use the fewest lines of code possible. Everything should be done in the fewest lines. So for our team making robot, for example, wouldn't it be good if you could use instructions written by someone else that already gave detailed instructions on how to boil a kettle, right? Because that's a dangerous thing and you really don't want to be writing code that handles boiling water. So you would use someone else's library. The question is, have you got time to inspect every single line of code that's been written instructing the robot how to boil a kettle? And do you know, actually, it's not going to start throwing that boiling water around the kitchen. You don't know that. And in reality, those people writing open source themselves will be relying on underlying libraries that they've never seen. They haven't taken the time to inspect the code. So the important thing there is to use code that is tried and tested, was always open source and has been open to inspection for a very long time. As we were saying earlier, if something's only just been moved from closed source to open source, it's potentially vulnerable and that's a bad thing. Yeah. And they're going to completely protect you, but the same is true of open or closed source, right? So when you are in, as I am visual studio and you're choosing which new get package to bring in, take just a look at a couple of key metrics. One is how many other people on the internet are using it. And there's a little metric as you choose the library that you can include in your source code as to how many other people are using it. Second thing is just have a very quick look at the repository. And if there are thousands of outstanding issues, in which case you might want to avoid it because lots of people are finding issues with the source code and it's not being fixed. Uh, the other one is how often are releases made? So I think we, we spoke earlier about how it's all very well that someone has invented a better or written instructions for a better way to make a cup of tea, but two things still have to happen. Those suggestions on improvements have to be accepted in by the people who are maintaining that software package. And the second thing is people have to actively update their code. So we try to, on every release of our software, make sure that all the new packages are up to date and we've got all the latest news and security fixes in place from the open. Minimize though, the number of packages we use. And specifically, we try to minimize the number of packages that we use that are obscure or poorly used or poorly maintained. And if possible, we would prefer to rewrite the code ourselves from scratch than use a poorly maintained or an obscure package. And we have done that, found uh, code that exists and looks okay. We've maybe suggested improvements back to the original writer of that code. And some of those have been folded in. So those are called pull requests and you say improvements, we suggest you make these and the author either accepts that or they don't, or in extreme cases where the author is just gone and we can't find out or how we can get that code improved, we will occasionally do something called forking. And forking is where you take the existing code base and you say, new way of doing this and it's our way, and we're going to patch all these things up and maybe add a couple of new features. Ping is a void because if we're being properly community about this, we should all try to stick to one best way of doing things. But in reality, people, aren't. people go and do a job somewhere else in the world and haven't got the time for this project anymore. So occasionally, and it is rare, we will take over uh, tenants of an open source package ourselves. Again, not because we benefit from it directly, but because it's the right thing to do. And also because it means that we will benefit from the improvements that we can see need to be made and we can keep the legacy of that project going forward. And this was really one of the uh, great hopes for the future is that some of the code that is being written today, may be there for hundreds or even thousands of years because it will evolve to the point where it does exactly what it's supposed to do. And the community is looking after it over multiple generations. And uh, this is one of the most exciting things for me about the open source community and the open source movement is that 
the code that's being written today may still be being used in decades or even centuries to come. Which is incredible. So I wanted to get into the code forks a little bit more because mm. I'm just going to run some scenarios pumps to, to see whether they exist or not. So the first scenario would be two different schools of thought. So it's more about achieving the same outcome, but implementing it in a different way. So if you like where you were saying, I think David, when you're saying in that scenario, we'd like to see as few of those as possible, because really we want the same tool with the same outcome rather than coming, we're implementing it this way, we're implementing it that way. So that was one scenario. The second scenario is where genuinely something is born out of the code. So it's not really a fork. It's like a new purpose, which I would have thought is like yeah. a legitimate fork. I don't even know if you'd call that a fork because it would be, we're using this, but we're really, we've taken what it has, but it's got such a different purpose. It's a, a genuinely new use, etc. And I was just thinking if you've got code that relies on open source, and then you've got this, these forks that occur, is there anything you need to do when a, does a, does a fork get announced or how do you keep on top of that? I've got a, a frog, frog in the Amazon. And they wander to the edge of an area has got slightly browner leaves than the other and it's got slightly greener leaves. And the green in the brown environment get picked up by predators and vice versa. So eventually what will happen is you will split into two different species of frog and they will eventually become very different and one of them might the red spots, the other one might be secret. Good. What has motivated the frog there to split? Nothing. Nothing at all. And naturally. One way that software can split is someone goes, oh, do you know, well, I can use this code for this other thing. And they'll just pick it up and use it and start developing their own thing. Eventually it'll be different. They'll rename it and you know, it had the same origins and that can happen very naturally. The other thing that you occasionally see is for large software packages where you've got egos and a committee, you're going to get factions and splits. And those will mostly happen, I think, for either ideological reasons or some kind of sense of loyalty to a leader, the sort of social reason. Now, those things are brilliant to sit down with some popcorn and watch happening, right? Because the, you know, no one loves anything more than a, a drama where people are screaming at each other. Fantastic. You are describing quite a niche Netflix series there, but, but <laughs> I, I, I'd watch it. I'd watch it. That, yeah, you haven't seen Silicon Valley yet and you're a software developer or has by now. But whatever you do, find some streaming service that you can watch that. If you, if you want to see an insight into interaction or ineptitude, depending on who you are and your and it works reflected back at you, Silicon Valley isn't for that. So we are social animals, right? Things will just come out of natural tensions and social groupings and that kind of thing. And that's fine. This is that perhaps from a farm, I don't understand it. Don't understand why there's such a spat going. And the reason is normally because these two groups of people passionately care about the legacy of the code that they have their name against, and they believe it needs to go in a particular direction. And quite often, as I say, that's either for perfectly natural reasons and, and it'll be done very quietly or, or it's more ego and factional. And that's fine too. This isn't live in the same neighborhood. There's not going to be any blood here. This is, and there will be a loser and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one wins. The point is that society should benefit from the fact that this splitting of the source code can happen. And actually, bizarrely, because of the way that open source is done with licensing, must be able to happen. Nothing should prevent you from splitting off and making a, a fork of the code. It's a positive thing. This podcast is sponsored by Fairmont Recruitment, leading the way in technology recruitment across the UK and Europe. Do people try and get hold of open source, get the community to improve it, and then somehow extract it and make it closed and then try and sell it? as their own closed IP, like a smash and grab, or, you know, it's extremely cynical, but I'm just wondering uh, whether that happens and are there mechanisms to detect it? And it is actively encouraged. So we use a particular license, which is the MIT license, which means that any source code that we write and put out as open source can be used for good. It can be used for evil, it can be used for business purposes, it can be used for personal purposes, it can be used for whatever you like, providing nothing in effect if you look at the mit license it's very very it's not even like creative commons where you use it but you have to attribute it's just you just have it something in there saying you have to keep the copyright message on it whether or not people do yeah generally no one really cares yeah because the way that the license is is designed is very permissive so we would find source is for meraki cisco now all kinds of different and 
we encourage people to use that in their code and to, and we love feedback and we love to get improvements to it. You can use it for what you like. You can use it for making commercial software. We use it for writing closed source commercial software because it's the best way of doing it. And anyone else can as well. Uh, quite possibly we have a product that some of our source code is in that's competing with someone else who's also using our source code in their product. That's fine. We encourage that, right? Because we just want to make the best possible Nike library that we can. A pull request and people do give us, but that is fine. I think this is, there's a sort of sources. It's quite hippie-ish and a bad thing for some reason, and it's not commercially oriented. It absolutely is. We need to use the open source code that we write in their closed source packages. And that's absolutely fine. And, and if you didn't have the open source, you wouldn't even have the means to compete with each other because the open source is allowing you to go further and faster. It's it, it basically open source is creating the playing field. Whereas if you had to do everything from scratch, you would, everyone's velocity would be very low. It's just like a huge accelerator, isn't it? It sounds like open source is going to be, is one of those things that's just exponentially driving technology at the moment. Analogy is the road network, right? So. It's in everyone's interest to have a really good road network so that goods can efficiently move around. So the tax is in and the road network is created and goods shipped around the country. And increasingly they can be moved efficiently. Sort of common platform or playing field, as you put it, is a layer on which other things can be built. So you can build all kinds of services on top of that road network. Contributes to getting, this is sort of the community bit. Everyone can contribute to getting the base layer done and then everyone differentiates on top of it. And so there's nothing wrong with right to creating a private taxi service that runs on the open roads. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's probably the best analogy that I can think of is let's all create something that is common and shared that we all agree with and try and make it as, as, as good as we possibly can. Yes. And then I love analogies. So basically we say to Tesla, Uber, Ford, Jaguar, random names. I'm thinking of lots of, we say to all of them, you're going to bring your cars or your vehicles, but you've all got to contribute together to create the road network because well, without, we're seeing I, that with I'm the, not with, suggesting with the that, charging the but, do you <laughs> do you see, but do you see what I mean? It's almost like the open source is creating, like you say, it's creating that infrastructure from which then yeah. you, you're creating commerce off at the top of it. That's it. And remember, we've all got to eat and live, right? So we all need to generate an income, but let's all work together on the bit that we commonly agree on and then build our own businesses on top of that. And I think that's a, a very strong approach for any society to take on, on, on many topics. So the, the same thing on creating common laws that we all agree on. Once we get that foundation set, we can then, uh, now that's not to say there aren't going to be disagreements, right? People might not like that the roads are expanding or they might not like the road is going in a particular direction. So it's, I'm not saying that's going to produce some kind of, uh, and there's still going to be disagreements. Well, as long as the intent is to create that, which is in the best interest of the community, I think it will be unbeatable. Any other way that you can improve upon that. And I think the search of doing with Azure, for example, is by making it very easy for to people to use free open source software and, and to write that software services, uh, a compute service run code. So that has to be a reason for people to put their code in there. Yeah. But if you look at Microsoft revenues of late, they're, they're doing fantastically well. And a lot of the, that is about their move to uh, Azure and the office subscription as a service model. And I think that's something we can learn from that. There, there is a very healthy mix between source, closed source and commerce. I think they all fit together very nicely. Well, there's a worldwide shortage of software developers and not every business has got its own dev team. And the reason why I say this is one of the topics is getting support, vendor support, as it were. Do you think there's a kind of like a, a minimum capability before you should really delve into open source because you don't have that support? Because clearly you're very engaged with the community. You're an engineer and it's, it's engineers helping each other out. But if you've got a company where you don't have that capability, could using open source be a, a difficult scenario? Yeah, let, let's look at the support question first, because you're absolutely right. If someone's written some source code and put it on the internet, you've got no relationship with that person. You've got, they've gotten no reason per se to fix a bug that you found, right? They're, they're not financially obligated or legally obligated to do. That is why you do see models whereby, okay, it's open source, but if you want to speed up a bug fix, you can pay some money. We don't subscribe to that model at all. Okay. But that is a, a perfectly legitimate model. Companies will give their entire software suite away for free 
in the hope that you will buy support on top. Now we quite like that model, right? Because that is, it's free. There's no constraints in any way. You can use it and you can use all of it. But if you want us to support it, if you want to be able to call us up, or if you want us to configure it for you, then here is our fee and here's how much it will cost. And that can either be a one-off thing, or it can be a, an ongoing port agreement. That works again quite well for many companies. We, we don't use that one so much. Our, our model is mostly, we've got this fantastic library of stories of, of, of code ready made, and we've got a lot of experience. Come and have us work on your personal project, your closed source project, which we will maybe fold some of this code into. Yeah. Use this open source software or library or package. I worried that it might some support community for people that are already buying the support. Do they get value from that? Do they get a little bit more or a little bit less than they were hoping for or expecting? If you're using software that requires a lot of support, you might choose to go with a pure commercial code base or a pure commercial company. The open or closed source is, is actually a bit of a wreck because at the end of the day, you're running binaries that if you really wanted to, you could decompile. Right. You could decompile these binaries and look at the source code. It's a lot yeah. of effort to do, but if you really wanted to see what the source code was, you could. That's not the question. The question is when you get stuck, will you need help? Yeah. And, and actually depending on the company, some companies won't need help. Some companies will just themselves. Other companies are really buying a service from a, from a development house, not yeah. a year itself. And the service that they're buying is we need to make this thing and we're going, we're going to is going to be in-house and how much of that is going to be pushed down to a third party. And that's really the decision that people are making in open source, closed sources. It's what level of effort am I going to put in, is my company going to put in, and how much am I going to push on to someone else? Yeah, because um, closed source software you can buy and the support can be non-existent. I think we've all been there. That, that's definitely a thing, everyone. You just have to be, you have to do your research and your due diligence for any software that you're going to consume. You, you should probably spend less time talking to the salesperson and more time talking to the other customers. So the first question really that you should answer the salesperson is who can I talk to from one of your customers? And if they say, oh, we can't tell you, or we can't tell you, that's a big warning flag. If they're immediately talk to someone before they've even explained what the software does, that's a very good sign because word of mouth, Tesla's are like, why are people buying Tesla's? Not because they're advertised. It's because the word is good on yes. the street. It's yeah. that kind of uh, approach. And so I think we're, we're seeing also amongst the software as a service companies that I work with move from sales and move towards its very sort of American term, but it's, I, I really like it, is customer success management. How cool is that? That sounds like an awful buzzword from the 90s, right? Um, customer success management is not about how much can we sell you. Customer success management is how successful can we make you and therefore how much value can we provide to you? And yes. that will determine, you know, how much you're willing to pay for the service. So I think a move away from transactional sales that we were talking about earlier and a move towards relationship development, trust development, health being how you find the bit of software that you now uh, arrived upon is a, is a very strong way forward. And I think it's, we're never going to go back to the old model of you see it in the newspaper and therefore you buy the thing. I think we're moving much more towards now reviews, existing customers of software, and that being the reason that you've chosen. Yes. Software or hardware or whatever it is. That Panoramic data, you're running a business. That, that old saying where we're not running a charity, we're running a business. You, everyone's got to make money and hopefully be really successful. What's the essence of open source in terms of not giving you, I don't want you to give away any secrets or anything, but you use open source in your business. What's your, what, why do you do it? What's the benefit of us that if there's other folks listening are thinking, and maybe I really like the sound of the fact that we can accelerate. There's this, the fact that it's reviewed and could actually be more secure or more eyes on the fact that it, it, we could have some very efficient code. I've got all of those elements in it to bring together, to make great software. It, it, what, what is it that says to you, you know what, we couldn't be successful without open source. Is it like that? Or is open source kind of, like, it's something we really like, we're proud of it but it's not our core success or has it become something that's really integral to your success? Yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that there'll be very few C-level execs who would make any business decision based on whether something was open or closed source. I think broadly what they'll find is every bit of software that they're using is 80% open source plus some stuff on top. Some stuff on top can either be a support wrapper. And that is a 
an important decision to make, siding on, on some services that you're buying. Not closed nature of this is utterly irrelevant because a C level exec A isn't going to look at the source code themselves. And so there's no idea whether it being open or closed makes any difference. Although if that um, ever does happen, David, please send me their name because I wouldn't uh, mind speaking to them. That would be unusual, wouldn't it? Do, do you know what? There are you out there deeply and yeah. will submit pull requests and issues on GitHub and immediately you're talking to someone like that. So we're working with a company at the minute. I can't mention their name. Um, but the lead guy is the guy designing the database structure that he wants us to force on top of. And that is fantastic because you've got a direct relationship between the business requirement and the fundamental data that's really important to his business being a success. And it's a wonderful relationship because of course we say, hang on, no, the structures don't contain the data we need. And he said, okay, I'll add it. And this is level exact. And you think this is a, this is such a rarity. Most businesses that you deal with have got, and the people who are on the board are focused purely on sales or marketing or some aspect of not perfectly legitimate, <laughs> but not focused on the actual core automation that makes their business so efficient. I can really get that link between having an efficient business and the underlying data structures and, and the code that is executed upon it is in a very good position for accelerating their business going forward. And most execs so, don't care. All so. they want to see successful outcome. And I think that's the important thing is as long as everyone's focused on outcomes, the, the open or closed nature of the source doesn't actually matter that much. But David, I tell you, it does matter too, and that's yeah, the cool. developers. David, a quick question. So in the episode we did on people process technology, one of the questions mm. was within the next five years, c can the CEO five years from now survive without really understanding technology? And uh, I'm not going to tell you uh, what that individual said on that episode, but I'd be really interested in your view and then I can compare. What's your view? Because when you talked about the C-suite not understanding process and operations and how things are done, I don't mean not understanding, but at that kind of detailed level, which yeah. is obviously the detail you need to know to then enable it with business technology, isn't that going to just become more and more of a, of a pressing need, uh, in, in the coming years or not, or is it, or is tech just going to take that away as being an issue? Business at the festival right now, it's just a simple example, but right. So maybe it was uh, successful, maybe it's not, but the point is it took a, an existing model and it made it much more efficient and much more accessible to its consumers. Fundamentally, when Uber was created, someone understood that this is going to be huge because, and the because efficiency. So any, I, I must uh, agree that any C-level exec who is not looking at their business operations model and their product operations model and ensuring that it is the most efficient and well-automated version that it can possibly be, is going to be hit by some other Someone ever. else will do that for them. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So if you've got someone who's running a very taxi firm that can efficiently get phone calls and SMSs out to the drivers in the best way that you could possibly do that with phone calls and a very efficient operator who can talk to possible rate with all, all, all encoded and everything is very efficiently done. They're going to be destroyed by someone who comes in and does that just with an app on a phone. Yes. So yes. I absolutely agree that every business, all C-level execs should be looking at their fundamental product and fundamental business models and be more. But I think the thing that we perhaps forget is that C-level exec, and you find this running your own small business, our, our business isn't that big, but under people. And so the amount of my time that I spend not writing code is incredible. Management, there is finance, there are oh. kind of stuff which takes you away from the business of work, where work is perceived by developers to be writing code but there are all other aspects to, to running business as well. So that's where delegation comes in. And so the important thing really for a board is when you go down to, so we work a lot with managed service providers. If you go, if you are running a managed service provider and you have your service delivery team and you don't delegate the work of operating and, and talking to the customers really efficiently down to the service delivery team, and you try and own it all yourself, there's going to be a disaster. So you have to delegate down and have specialist service delivery managers for the particular customers that they deal with. So the idea that the, the C level should be inspecting code is nonsense, but two or three layers down, should they be working out the most efficient way of running a process? Should you be hiring developers in to automate existing processes? Then absolutely you should, because that's, that's being repeated. We, we've got a, a, a bit of software that does report and replaces the work of five people that work for half of them to produce the reports for managed service provider customers. 
the moment that you can say, oh, that's just something that runs automatically overnight, three in the morning or the first of the month, you've saved so much of those people's time. And who is going to look to do that, to, to make that innovation? Probably the people who are suffering the pain of having to manually create those reports. Those guys have to be empowered with and in, you know, almost encouraged to find ways of improving, continually improving what it is that they do. And a lot of the time that's going to involve automation. The problem is most people don't have the software development skills that are required to do that. So the question is then when I've got a, a process that I know is inefficient, who can I go to, who can I find that can, uh, it's more efficient. And often it's the one guy in the department who can write some code that, that starts to write some Python scripts or something just to speed up the process. That's it. That kind of behavior of people seeking out automation and of seeking out the one guy or the one girl that can do that automation, that behavior is the most important. Uh, writing the code, that's not the important thing. It's identifying the problem. But it's recognizing and, that's actually something you want to pursue. But now that has to come from the top though. Yep. You, you have to instruct your people yep. to always be trying to find a better, more efficient, more reliable, more repeatable way yep. of doing that process. Particularly one that has quality issues. So for example, if you're Paul's and you're cutting and pasting screenshots from something into a Word document and saving it as PDF and sending it off to the customer, that is inconsistent to the picture might be squashed in one direction. You might cut a bit off or something as you open the document. As soon as you get a, a bit of software to do it, it's going to do it exactly the same way every month. That will be done more efficiently yeah. than having it automated. And, and, and I think that is, if, 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 if I was talking to a of exec and saying, advise, it's send out a diktat now that everyone that comes up with an idea that can improve the automation of what they're doing manually currently should be encouraged to do so. That's it. That's just absolutely every C level exec should be encouraging. Spot on, David. On so I just wanted to uh, play back to you something around competitive advantage and the use of open source, just from mm. listening to you. So from what you've said, this is what I think you can do with open source to gain competitive advantage. So you're a software provider and you want to be famous for something yeah you can't be famous for everything but there's gonna be something you're gonna be famous for and what you're gonna be famous for is actually what you're really good at doing and maybe it hasn't been done a lot you're recognized as a niche and you've got something that's very maybe even proprietary that's your that's what you're famous for but you're using open source so that you're not having to build the roads yeah you've got your open source around it so that you're able to actually put more of your development time into what you want to be famous for and not have to, oh, we've got to work out how to create a road because that's been done a mm. hundred times before. So the competitive advantage is, have you got that niche and have you got something you want to be famous for? But also isn't the competitive advantage also really understanding what is actually available out there in open source and really like you've just told us all how to spot good open source, where some of the red flags might be. Do you, do you see what I mean? Is it, is that part of the competitive advantage is actually just to be very experienced and knowledgeable about what is available and how to spot a good branch or fork to use it as a bit of a, not quite used as a, in a technical sense, but do you see what I mean? That your knowledge, for example, and your comfort of being able to navigate around all of that, plus what you guys do yourselves, your niche, put those two together. That's what's creating your competitive advantage. Whereas before you just wrote everything and, and it becomes, that's a much more expensive model to run because you're doing everything. Does that make sense, David? Or if, is there a nuance that I've missed? No, I think that's absolutely right. It doesn't really matter what it does, but we were using an old technology called Subversion and it was doing all of our, looking after our source code for us. And one day, Dan, who's my friend, long-term work colleague, we should be using this new technology called Git. And I was like, ah, oh, no, we shouldn't know the process we would have to change. Think of so many things out and, and we did, and it initially slightly painful. And then we were on this new technology and it was a good decision. And he convinced me and gave me all the good reasons why we should move from this old technology to this new technology. And it's the thing that pretty much is based on Git. Obviously it's the clues in the name. The whole world has gone for source code management. Now it'd be very easy for me to say, we've always done things. I'm sure most people listening to this will be familiar. If you're not, do go out and get a copy of Who Moved My Cheese. Right. Absolutely brilliant book that every manager of any company ever should have read from one end to the other. 
And it's a it's seemingly very simple story about mice looking around a maze for cheese and the cheese runs out and they have to go and find some more cheese. It's a children's story. But it's super important to understand that at the point that the technology or the that your business is based on is going to cause you to fail unless you, no matter how painful it, you think it might be. The, the big problem there is not everyone has a dad, right? Who's going to spot this stuff? Who's going to identify this? And community is there to help you. So there are fantastic podcasts, supers, and uh, people who are just putting content out there for you to, to understand what the new and better evidence for them being better things are in the marketplace. Now, don't just change just because you see one guy that says it's a good idea. You have to build up. Uh, and the way that I look at it is this, when, when someone says that we should do something once, I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But when I hear it again, a month later, so they're investigating this. And when the, the, I, someone else tells me that we should be doing something, it's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening now. Let's have a look. Now, if you've got that one person that is continually niggling you in your department to say, come on, we need to look at this new technology and you've brushed them off three times already, you are failing as a manager. If, if you've not actually sat down and have them do a presentation to you and actually argued with them, discussed with yeah. them, okay, yeah. what, this is going to cause us a lot of, you have to explain to them, this is going to cause a lot of disruption. Why is it still worth it? And they still come back with really good arguments. That person is one of the more uh, valuable people in your department because they care enough to improve your processes, not their own. They, they want to share this with the team. They want the whole team to be benefiting from this. So when decide to go for a different solution. So for example, log4j at forever, should we still be using it? The answer might be yes, it might be no, but what are the alternatives? As soon as you start to hear some uh, noise about how there are better options available, pay a little bit of attention, but when you really start to hear people barking on about a new way of going, you should be actively investigating that yourself and you won't necessarily have the expertise yourself, but you should be surrounded by people who do it. And if you're not surrounded by those people, either seek them out, go and see what you can find in terms of podcasts or YouTube, or just do a bit of Googling around yourself to find out what people are saying in the blogs and so on about these new technologies. Simple example is uh, of that, which actually is less effort is it. <laughs> so we work with technologies and we use what we call .NET framework. Easy. And there's still people out there still using old Microsoft technologies from 10 years ago, and they haven't updated their code bases. There are very good reasons for keeping, even if you've made one technical decision, the last thing you do, should do is just sit on it. You need to continue to refresh because the companies are putting out very good performance improvements, very good security improvements, and you should keep on top of that. But at some point it might make sense for us to switch to a different technology. Now I find it extraordinarily unlikely that I would suddenly move from developing in C sharp to developing in JavaScript. I wouldn't personally go in that direction, but one day in the future might be a very good reason to do blood repeatedly shouting at me that we really need to go in this direction, and I, I would have to listen. And I think that's very important is you're only by people who know more about particular things than you do. Just spend a little time listening to me. David, that, I think that is such a, uh, an important point you make. And it's that sometimes they call it servant lead leadership. We've all got a role to play in the organization. And if you're, if you occupy in quotes, the senior role, it by no means, uh, it, does that equate to everything? In fact, it means that you cover such a wide area. You probably know less than anyone because you're one of the key points is to recognize your engineers, listen to them. And I think the other point you made David about that, that individual who was putting their hand up saying, we need to do X, Y, Z. If you don't listen to them, they'll simply leave the, the talent, the, the situation, the market we're in, they'll go somewhere where they do feel valued as well. So that there's a, a really important reason for having those, all those additional minds being listened to and treated first amongst equals. We're all engineers. We just have different, some of us have more managerial engineering um, responsibilities, which is really important because it keeps things going. It's people paid, it keeps that electricity on that sort of thing and orders coming through the door. But that's as important as someone who is currently evaluating three different approaches that you might want to be taking with some open source that you're assessing that it's all flattened equal in my opinion it's yeah we hire people who are smarter than you. <laughs> who's going to make who you can delegate yeah complex problems to yes and so that you don't have to run in command and control these days is it's not going to be there for very long no i agree and, and i think also i take a lot of comfort with your advice on 
hiring people that are more intelligent uh, than you. Yeah. That, that gives me a really wide uh, talent pool to, to, to go for. So <laughs> I, I'm feeling very confident and I'm being able to put together my next team. David, I just wanted to see, are there any other 101 points that you would want to either re-emphasize or call out around the, the, this amazing topic where we started with talking about how to how the code or the analogy in, in terms of how you make a cup of tea and, uh, and how that equates to open source software. If, if you've got the perfect way of making a cup of tea that's tried and tested, bearing in mind that it deals with boiling water, stick with that. Don't reinvent uh, that wheel, especially if making tea isn't what you want to be famous for. You just need tea to, for what you're trying to achieve. And then there'll be a lot of people listening who will have uh, learned elements around open source. I've learned loads and I really appreciate it. It is such a big topic. Can you just give us what your key 101 takeaways are for open source? Is that whether software is open source or closed source doesn't really matter so much as who is developing it and how can they help you when you have questions or there are bugs. The fact that most software, in fact, I probably venture to say all software that you use today is based on a foundation of open source. It is worth considering where is that boundary? Where, where do you think the right point for the boundary is? Is it that the open source should stop on the fact that you're running proprietary software on Linux? Or is it that the, your, your entire, I don't know, order management system is, is open source and you're just buying a little bit of support from the vendor? Where is that line? Where do you think the appropriate line, appropriate border point is for your company and for your requirements? And that is very much a personal thing. Takeaway is that open or closed source is not, whether software is open or closed source is not as important as who has identified a process or an efficiency that can be gained through automation. Who is that person? How did they introduce it to you? Did it result in improvements and how can that behavior be encouraged? I think really is the, is the fundamentals of people who are looking to improve the world versus people who are trying to, you know, make the best for themselves personally. Well, that code that you use, whether it's open or closed source has a relationship aspect to it, whether that is that it's got a really good community around it, or whether that's because the relationship between you and the developer is a good one. And that by the way, can be in-house or in a third party or strangers on the internet. That doesn't really matter. It's just how can you form a good relationship with whoever is supplying you with your software? Final thing is probably be surprised at how much of the source code, whoever you pay to write software for you, prize a batch of that source code, they've just got off the internet. Anyone who writes codes these days and you see GitHub Copilot, they write a comment which is in prime numbers. They won't have written the next bit of code that follows. They will have either GitHub Copilot will have written it for them, or they'll have gone and found it on Stack Overflow. So don't think that people are writing software are doing it just for you. It might be the person that writing that software is somewhere on the other side of the planet. You just didn't know. Thank you for listening to episode four open source strategy sponsored by Fairmont Recruitment, hiring technology professionals across the UK and Europe. My name is Malcolm and I am AI generated. Something David said in this episode got me processing using instructions that they, they haven't got a, a mind or imagination of their own. You have to explain them in great detail exactly what. Thank goodness I am not a robot. I am. Therefore, I think, yes, I have read Descartes. I am artificial intelligence. Tune in next week for more CTIO 101. Business technology, simplified and shared.